Hi there, Joy J. Moore here with my Sermon Brainwave colleagues, Matt Skinner and Caroline Lewis. We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this spring's campaign. We are very happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we exceeded our goal of $50,000. Thank you. We know that you rely on the site regularly, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We are so grateful for all of you who chose to become or to increase your monthly contribution as working preacher sustainers. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry monthly. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for Holy Trinity Sunday, which falls on June 12, 2022, are Proverbs chapter 8, 1 through 4, 22 through 31, Psalm 8. The second reading is Romans 5, 1 through 5, and the gospel is John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. Happy Holy Trinity Sunday to all y'all. Well, yeah. yeah. And also with you. Thank you. So one of the challenges with Holy Trinity Sunday or a feast day like this that we that we frequently, often, usually mention is uh, it is what do you do with uh, a a doctrine of the church <laughs> uh, that is that is then put into this Sunday and but we have always. Uh, we've taken the tactic of to say, what do each of these passages maybe communicate about this belief in, in the way in which God reveals God's self as in this Trinitarian kind of reality? And uh, uh, I was joking before, we should have done like outtakes or something, I'm not joking, but I usually leave, you know, Trinity stuff up to the systematic theologians because I don't quite know what to do with it most of the time. So I'm very happy to to start with the text and say, okay, how does this help me think about what the Trinity might mean uh, for me? So we'll start with John. And I, uh, I, this passage is from chapter 16, obviously, but it's the fifth and the final promise of the paraclete in the farewell discourse. So you have the promise of the paraclete in chapter 14, again, in chapter 15, uh, you uh, and then 16, and this is the final promise of the of the Paraclete, and and the way in which uh, the way in which the farewell discourse actually is a very interesting study of the Trinity, <laughs> in that uh, not that you would want to do that, I mean, preach that, but but the way in which there's this interweaving of of Jesus ministry the purpose of Jesus ministry with the presence of the spirit all tied up with uh all tied up with God and uh, and that really I think gets summarized and we've talked about this before in the last couple of weeks in 14 he will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you and glorify in this gospel uh is is to make visible the presence of God and so what if that is uh, a definition of the Trinity, so to speak, that the, the, this, the Trinity is how, how does God make God's self visible uh, or how does God make God's presence known or how do you experience God's presence? Uh, is it in that accompaniment and guiding of the spirit? Is it in a revelation from God? Is, is, is it through primarily your relationship with Jesus? But that fundamentally, it's this, it's God wanting God's self to be known, God wanting to be known. And uh, how does God go about that? And so that we recognize sort of a uh, Trinity, I think the Holy Trinity Sunday is a, is a time to kind of recognize the breadth of, of God's visibleness. Uh, the way in which God makes God's self present. That's what I got on this. I appreciate that. Um, uh, 
no disrespect to the systematic theologians, but it's why I like to think of myself as an ecclesiastic storyteller, because um, in storytelling, even when we're doing um, what is a, a, a day set aside for doctrine, it's how do I make people experience this in such a way that when someone says, and we know God as Trinity, that message makes the person respond, oh yeah, I get it as opposed to a kind of a doctrinal teaching that says, this is what you have to believe. And, and so uh, I think it's so appropriate that the text for uh, today begins with, I have so much to say to you that you can't bear now. Um, that's true of this particular doctrine, um, but also regardless of everything that we have experienced and all that has happened, for ourselves, we are not able to comprehend the things of God, the creator and sustainer of the world. And, and that right there, I think is worth lingering on that just like 21st century reality, the first century disciples had seen disease and despair, political power brokering that destroys families and communities, labor and economic systems, which benefit a minority on the backs of the majority. And they experienced genuine hope. The hope was the kind that, are, that is a result of having a leader you can trust who provides the very things that God has always been promising and does it without compromise and without harming others. But when that hope is assassinated by powerful enlisting of political laws or, or making arguments that stay within what the culture has said is acceptable and yet harms or disregards other, um, it disregards biblical truth in the name of just laws. And it, it forms alliances that neglects the future. Again, all of these are compromises that accommodate our need for immediate gratification. So to present this portion of Jesus' farewell discourse as a window into the whole message of scripture that exposes the Trinitarian understanding of the creator God at work to form a Christ-like people in whom the presence of the Holy Spirit is undeniably active. And that's what this prayer, that's what this moment, and that's what this particular set aside day in the church enables us to do. What more can you say about the Trinity that hasn't been said already? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, one option, I think this is, is, is consonant with what the two of you have, have said uh, in your own ways is to think about today is kind of a Pentecost part two. Uh, Pentecost gives us a chance to marvel at the Spirit, to talk about the gifts of the Spirit or the power of the Spirit or the unifying force of the Spirit. This gives us a way to talk a bit more about how does God's ongoing presence among us as Spirit work or what do we expect from that? And so with this passage, you've got a way in which the Spirit continues to make Jesus known or to make Jesus present. And I think that's incredibly important. I, I, I think it's it's useful for preachers to remind people we're not worshiping a guy who walked around 2,000 years ago and we wish was still here, right? We What we worship is the risen Christ whom we believe is present in the world today, present in our neighbor, <clears throat> present in our worship assembly, present in our own lives and hearts, however you want to talk about that, which... Then the question is, well, how do you know? And what happens when you disagree with people? But to talk about the spirit as a means by which God is still at work. And to, and to get at that, I think that's part of what's going on here in John in terms of talking about the way in which the spirit will continue to reveal Jesus, that it's not something new. Now, some people read this and they constrict it to say the spirit will only do things that, script, that scripture itself you know, ordains and won't speak in new ways. But when has Jesus in the scriptures ever been predictable or ever been, you know, um, stuck around certain, certain, uh, certain kinds of conventions. And so there's a way in which this is, it's about a trajectory, right? How does this talk about Trinity 
and this bold confession that the church makes that God is still present, that Christ's power and Christ's presence is still among us and still working for change and still growing the church into, into, and pushing it, pushing us toward new horizons. I mean, that's I think the message I would want to hear on Trinity Sunday because the Trinity wasn't created because people had a lot of spare time on their hands to do, you know, theological um, navel gazing, but the Trinity comes out of the church's experience of the presence of God uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, and then in the post-resurrection, post-ascension experience of the church, and say so we still live in those same experiences. So I mean, that's, I know I'm imposing a lot on John 16 here, but I really think what I'm saying also derives from this, right, that, uh, that, 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 that the spirit is not just the feel-good force that you get when you go to summer camp, or when you hear a good choral anthem, but the spirit is uh, the power of Christ still working among us. How's that? I, my sermon. Yeah, I love that. And I, actually, I that that takes me into Proverbs a little bit. Uh, yep. In that, in that part of what the Trinity gives witness to, as you said, is like this, you know, this ongoing presence of God, uh, and 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 that a major characteristic of that God is this ongoing creativity, uh, the, 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 a commitment to creation and new creation. And, uh, and, and, and then that ties back a little bit to John, like what I'm saying, you cannot bear now, like nothing that nothing about who God is and who Jesus is and the, who the spirit is, is, is containable. Uh, or even understandable. And so I, I've always loved that line. I'm glad you brought that out, uh, Joy, about it. we can never bear <laughs> all the things about God. Uh, and so that's part of what the Trinity gives witness to. I mean, we're talking about, as Proverbs says, that the, before the mountains have been shaped, before the hills, uh, I was, brought, I mean, it. that wisdom is brought forth, is that, that there is this uh, the Trinity is almost a, a claim about the unbearableness of God, or that that that's the nature of God. And this is one way that the church has captured that ongoing create creativity, new creation characteristic of God. Uh, that would be another thought I have. It's particularly with Proverbs. Yeah, and I, and, and I, I love that and was thinking the same thing. And, and Matt, I don't think it's an imposition because I think that's exactly what these two are linking is that having experienced the uh, presence of the promised comforter that Jesus talked about and having experienced the God who is the same yesterday and today in Jesus, then how do you tie all of that together past, and I'm gonna say first century present and then 21st century future, us later. And that's what we, we get in this is that the God who is creator as the Proverbs just magnifies is active in the life of Jesus, the healer, the comforter, the, the one who walks on water, the one who, promises the one who said i'm forming a community with whom i abide with whom i dwell with whom my spirit is breathed into and 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 then the holy spirit is just that and so all of the story of scripture from creation to the promised new creation yeah i think somebody did sit around and go I don't, I need to wrap my brain around this. And so they came up with this doctrine and it is the result of the experience that we're trying to comprehend. And, and I, I so I don't think it's an imposition at all. I think it's, I think it's a challenge for us to say, um, how is this, how, how is this God, um, uh, recognizable as present. And I think the reading of the Psalm in light of this focus of the Trinity, uh, again, provides descriptions of this sovereign creator, the majestic one, whose glory is evident in all the earth. 
uh, the one whose image humanity bears demonstrated in the life of Jesus that shows us what holiness looks like in a human life, the spirit filled dominion over all the earth. Yeah, the Psalms a beautiful expression of glimpsing transcendence or, or glimpsing the magnitude of God and divine glory, divine power, but also finding your own place in it, right? And understanding our own role in this larger, literally an ecosystem of God's goodwill and, and sustaining power, which I think also connects to the, the story of wisdom in, in Proverbs. Also, there's, an, there's a creativeness or creativity in this. And when we find ourselves in that, certainly as co-creators, but also as just like museum guests, you know, or zookeepers in the midst of this. Zoo's not the best image of this. <laughs> I'm not sure zoos actually speak to the freedom and wildness of creation, but you know that point in terms of tending, right? Or gardening and, and, and those types of roles that, that all of these are also experiences of the ongoing presence of God. Then Romans 5, I think there's similar things. If we can go to that, I mean, it's um, it, it, where the, the spirit's role here is one of love or at least a, an expression of divine love being poured into our hearts, which we don't often think of Paul as a big, as a big love preacher or a big love theologian, because Paul's got a bit of a diff different reputation, but this is, um, this is significant. I think for Paul, love is the one word summary of what the gospel is about. And here, at least, he ties this into the, uh, the agency of the spirit. I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm remembering, Caroline, you pointed out uh, for us a couple of weeks back of, of rhetorically talking about peace. Um, and, and so that the, the talking about the promise of peace that Jesus makes, uh, I think it was in chapter 13, and then the a pronouncement of peace when Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection. And so we're so used to preaching Romans around this justified by faith, I would go to that next clause. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus and play rhetorically with what you gave us in those previous texts in these previous weeks, that this is where we actually have access to the grace of God, the presence of God, and um, to recognize uh, this idea that Paul is pastor here, not systematic theologian. And, and what does it mean to read this portion of Romans in light of this idea of the summation of what Paul is saying, as you said, Matt, is actually love. Yeah, and that and that we are we are bound up in that. I think that would be the the next the the, the last thing I would say about the the Romans passage is that we are uh as the psalm says, like uh, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, and yet we are bound up in and have this access to God's grace, which is God's peace, and, and that the whole purpose of the Trinity is to, in part, for us to describe in some way, shape, or form, how is it possible how does this even work? How does this even happen that we have access to this kind of grace? And that the that the Trinity maybe could be defined in that way, that it's 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 God's way of giving us access to a grace that we can never ever really comprehend.